Thank you. I figured out to turn off my, I mean, turn on my camera. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Gloria Parker with Parker Group Consulting, CEO. Uh, just this little bit of background, I'm the first and former uh, CIO of the Department of Education and former and first CIO at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, where between the two, I spent 10 years uh, meeting with people from industry. But prior to that, I spent um, uh, 17 years of my career at IBM Corporation in sales. And um, so I wanted to share with you some things that I've observed firsthand uh, when meeting with uh, industry partners through my career in government for 10 years. Um, next slide, please. There, there is a, a system that really has to be understood in the realm of business development, the whole business development life cycle, and all these pieces really fit together. Uh, you can't do one successfully and ignore the other. So the first one, of course, is business development, which is all about building and utilizing relationships to help build uh, successful engagements. Capture, you all know, is uh, actually um, going for business, actually pursuing an opportunity in government. And then once you've won that opportunity, you have to deliver the service and you've got to do that in a way that um, enhances not only the performance of government, but the performance uh, of your company as well. But underlying all of that is acquisition. And if you Acquisition moves through all of these components. They're all very, very important. Uh, they all intersect as success. And if you really understand all of them, they're all involved in building relationships. One of the things that I always try to make sure uh, to teach my students, because we are in collaboration with George Mason University, uh, Shar School of Policy to teach companies how to do business with the federal government. And one of the things I always try to make sure my students understand is how to build that trust relationship and become a trusted partner with those folks in the federal government that you're meeting with. So next slide. There are a number of things that we teach, but there is a process. There are phases that you have to go through. Uh, I'm not going to read all these to you, but you have access to it but I will go through a few of them just so that you understand. First of all, know the business. Uh, don't go into a federal agency and ask them, what do they do? Uh, before you go, you should already know what they do, know a lot about what's going on. You're looking at their website. You, you talk to people, you understand uh, their um, purpose in life. And then once you understand that, you also have to understand the procurement rules. Um, there, you, you can get in a lot of trouble if you don't understand that, but it's not that difficult if you take the time to really understand what the, the procurement rules are so that you can operate within those rules. Uh, the third thing I want to emphasize is you got to know who to talk to. You got to know who you know, need to meet with and you need to understand how to go about doing that, how to find out who those people are that you need to talk to. Talk to the right people and understand what it is that you can do to help that person and what you're looking for from them. Uh, it's a two-way street and you should never go into a meeting with a, 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 a government executive or a government personnel just with your one-sided view of what you want out of the meeting. They need something too because you're taking their time and that means that um, you should know how to build those relationships. Uh, we go through a whole series of how to build those relationships, but you've got to know how to build them and build them well. Know how to create the mindset of a trusted partner, not a salesperson uh, who's going in to, to close a deal. That's not what you're doing. You're going in to absolutely help the customer uh, solve a business problem. You want to be viewed as their teacher, their consultant, um, that trusted partner that they can rely on 
And you really need to know how to turn that mindset into that of a trusted partner. It's a big difference between the mindset of a salesperson and the mindset of actually being a trusted partner. Uh, the next thing is research, 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 research. There's tons of research out there that you can access, which is really great with the government, unlike industry, because everything is out there. They have to, it's government. Uh, your tax dollars are what's keeping them in business. They have to tell you uh, what's going on. They have to make things public. So do your research, look at the budget, look at all the other documents, there's tons of them, and, and a lot of sessions that you can go to to understand what they are trying to do and what, what their issues are. Uh, but you got to do the research. And the best business development and companies uh, who succeed do all of their research. Know how to get a meeting with the customer. Uh, there is a, a, a manner in which you go about doing that. There are ways to get those meetings. But it's not just let me come in and talk about my capabilities because they can read that. The real deal is you got to go in and let them know how you can help them solve a problem. And uh, in order to understand what it is they need to solve, you have to have done your research and your homework and then become an expert in conducting that meeting. The meeting is not walk in with PowerPoint presentation on capabilities. It's really to go in and have a, a planned outcome meeting where you understand when you're going in to talk to them, what it is that they need to understand from you and what you need to understand from them. And they don't want to know your capabilities until they know that they want to do business with you. So there's a lot of discussion that goes on in those meetings about their problems and their needs. Next slide, please. So in order to learn more about these topics that I just went over, uh, as I mentioned, we are partnered with uh, George Mason University's um, uh, Shar School of Policy. And you, our contact information is on these slides that you now have access to. We look at the next slide, you see the email address is there uh, or the, the websites, I'm sorry, but the next slide also tells you what our contact information is. Uh, I, there's so much information to share. Uh, I just gave you not the tip of the iceberg, I only gave you a grain of sand. Uh, there's so much more to understand and we hope that um, we can be helpful in making you successful in this marketplace. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Great information. Research, research, research. That's what I heard. <laughs> um, well, next up, I'm going to pass the microphone over to another one of our experts. Um, and I believe it's Kitty Klaus. Yeah. All right. OK, good morning. I am delighted to be on this panel as it's a terrific subject for small business. And I really appreciate what Gloria had to say about how to talk to the customer. That was that was great stuff. Um, I've spent 22 years with a very large IT contractor and 19 of those years were spent managing their GSA schedules and the large multiple IDIQs called GWAX and MAX. About five and a half years ago, I moved to a small woman-owned, economically disadvantaged business that specialized in cybersecurity, cloud engineering, and information sharing, and I've enjoyed every minute of this. Over the past five years, we've nearly doubled our revenue from 12 to $24 million, and our future outlook looks great. So what are we doing right? Um, I think the biggest thing we do is we focus on our competencies. We don't try to be everything and bid everything. Um, by focusing on core competencies, we've been able to build a very targeted workforce that understands the technologies. We focus our proposal resources on opportunities that have a strong win probability um, based on past performance, technical know-how, and employee quals. And we've developed an industry reputation as the go-to source. And this really strengthens our position on teaming agreements when we're negotiating swim lanes or work share. 
The second thing we did was we saw where the market or technology was headed and we got ahead of it. We just didn't meet it. We got beyond it. Ten years ago, we were helping a federal customer migrate to the cloud and we began modernizing their SharePoint environment in a public cloud. We quickly recognized the opportunity that cloud offered and we began ramping up our cloud engineering capabilities. Um, we did that through targeted hiring and decreasing our focus on technologies that were being de-emphasized, such as SharePoint. As an early adopter of the cloud, we learned how to meet the cyber regulations in the cloud and also focused on addressing identity challenges um, that were required to connect users to the cloud services. These early shifts fostered our experience, and we ultimately have won two, two $50 million cybersecurity contracts that are now propelling us forward. Um, had we stayed with on-premises services, I don't think we'd have had the experience our customers are leveraging for our services today. Um, but these transitions don't happen overnight. It really takes focus on that North Star. Um, the third thing we've done is we've really invested in experienced leadership in business development and growth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really important to have a realistic and actionable pipeline, and it takes a lot of work. Um, you need to understand, you know, is what is the real opportunity versus a possibility? How are you going to make it happen? Uh, how's the customer feel about the incumbent? Who makes for a strong partner? Um, by investing in experience, someone who knows the business and has a good track record of bringing in business um, is really key. Our tech gurus are great at their jobs, um, but tracking down and qualifying opportunities is not their core capability. Same with the business owner. She's got enough on her plate. So hiring and incentivizing seasoned business developers um, is critical. Now, you're a small business. You may need to start with cons on a consulting basis to be able to afford them, just being realistic. Um, we're small and BD is expensive, so we've also extended our reach um, by bringing on consulting businesses who provide us with curated pipelines. So we're only qualifying deals that fit with our capabilities. Again, going back to, you know, focus on what you bid on. Just don't try and be everything. Um, I'll also had, add that having a strong and experienced proposal manager is a huge add to your BD team. Um, a good proposal manager will have established processes in place and ensure the response is compliant with the RFP. They'll marshal the writers to ensure milestones, you know, towards completing the response. Nobody likes a death march. Um, and everything's done in a timely manner because the sloppy and poorly thought out proposal responses are not successful proposals. Um, a complete, compliant, and well thought out RFP response is a great start to an executed contract award. The last thing we do is we're very selective in who we partner with. As a small business with great technical jobs, we're very attractive as a subcontractor. For large businesses, we check off lots of socioeconomic boxes. Um, we have some that want to be our mentors so they can pursue business otherwise out of their reach, and others want us for our expertise. All of these reasons are great reasons to partner, um, but each has their place and each defines what your future on the opportunity and hence your revenue stream is going to look like. I have one agreement that states if we grow out of being a small business, we're off the team. Um, OK, so that's not exactly showing love for our expertise, but maybe short term, it's an entry to a new customer. Others will bring you in on the team, but they might ask you for rates that are below, well below market. And I got to tell you, it's OK to say we know bid that labor category. Remember, you're running a business. Um, it's important to have a balance between being a prime and a subcontractor, the deals. Um, it's fine to sub, but you also want a prime because you need to establish your reputation. You will need to develop past performance and demonstrate you can manage a contract. Continually being a subcontractor kind of always puts you at the whim of the primes, um, pricing, their terms, and assigned work, while having prime calls generally improves your win probabilities. I mentioned reputation. It's really important. 
Choosing partners, whether you're in a prime or subcontractor role, means being aware of your reputation. You want to control your own destiny. Know who you are teaming with. What is their industry reputation? What is their performance like? Where do they perform? Um, I always like to look at their GSA schedules to see what their rates look like and see if we can perform under their rates or they can perform under our rates. Um, I like to see what labor categories they have. I look at their websites. I do some research on them. Um, look at FPDS and see, you know, what contracts they have, um, what they're looking like, how they're being funded and by who. Um, so it's important to control your work that way. Overall, we have a number of solid partnerships where it all comes together. We jointly go to market and we enhance each other's capabilities. Our reputations, business and revenue models all demonstrate positive growth. One last piece of advice. Um, the symposium will provide lots more detail, but I'd say if you're new to the business, having a GSA multiple award schedule is a great place to start that journey. And now I'll yield the floor to Mike McHugh. Thank you, Kitty. And while Mike gets him, comes on stage, um, I just want to remind everybody, you should see a Q&A box on the side of your screen there. So if you have questions for any of our presenters today or as we go forward, please use that. Uh, that's your best way of getting your question addressed live. Uh, okay, so Mike, I will turn the floor over to you. And while he makes his way here, I will also let you know that I saw a few chats about uh, resources, about how do I download a copy of something. Uh, you should see a resources tab on the event feed on the right-hand side of your screen, where you can download the presentations that you're about to see today. And Mike, we cannot see or hear you. There we go. All right, Mike, take it away. Okay. Um, am I am I showing properly on your screen? Because it, there we go. Now I am. Thank you. Happy Wednesday morning to everyone from Reston, Virginia. I am Mike McHugh. I'm with ASRC Federal. We're on the senior director for IDIQ the IDIQ PMO, which is a variety of the GWACs and schedules and major agency IDIQs. Um, ASRC Federal is an Alaska native holding company, and we have 31 subsidiaries, and they include eight A's, hub, one hub zone, several small businesses, and some large companies as well. Uh, these subsidiaries hold positions on 33 government-wide and major agency contracts. And uh, before joining ASRC Federal uh, three years ago, I served in a similar role at GDIT for 18 years. Been working with GSA directly on G with GWAX for 21 years. So I have a, a decent small business and a large business perspective. Given my role at ASRC Federal, I want to talk about the several weekly, at a minimum, reach outs to me, typically via email for people looking for subcontracting opportunities. Subcontracting is a great way to grow your business. And uh, it's also very critical, I think, to people just starting out. But uh, one of the critical distinctions between a, an effective outreach to a larger company is whether or not you self-differentiate from many competitors. Um, due to my role at ASRC Federal, my contact information is one of the few sets of contact information posted and available on our public page. So this makes me the target of several inquiries every week at a minimum uh, for subcontracting opportunities. And the, what the information I get in those inquiries really de will determine whether they have a, even a shot of going anywhere. And I just want to explain to people what the difference is. Um, typical, a, a very common call I get is, you know, uh, we're Acme Small Services, we're an 8 day firm or we're women-owned small business or we're hub zone or whatever. How are we gonna work with you? How are you gonna work with us? And because I get a lot of these and because I got paid by ASRC to work for ASRC and I don't see, there's not a whole lot of clear value in uh, engaging with these, these inquiries. I, I often just thank them for their interest, but I often ask them, what do they do? 
it's not unusual that I hear, oh, we do everything. That might sound like a really flexible, high potential uh, response, but it's actually the opposite. It's really a non-starter. Uh, I, I've got to know where to send your inquiry, first of all. I'm not the one who makes decisions on teaming for specific opportunities. Like a lot of larger businesses, we're organized around client sets, agencies. So if I don't even know what agency to send something to, then it's probably going to go nowhere. And it's probably not worth your time or mine. Another call that I get says, I see you're a prime contract holder on GSA 8A stars, for example. How do we get on your team? And as you probably know, 8A stars is a Three is the government-wide contract. You may know that GSA is smart about building their contracts so that teaming can be done on an ad hoc basis and doesn't have to be done at the IDIQ level. And that, that's really a tremendous flexibility and enables teams to organize based on the specifics of the requirement. Um, but because you don't have to team, and there's really just often there's a burden, unless there's some other strategic reason I don't really want to engage at the IDIQ level. I want to engage on more specific information and more specific targets. And so here's an example of a more effective inquiry. And I got one just like this yesterday where someone said, hey, Mike, we're Acme Small Services. Not, I'm making that name up. We're a woman-owned small business. We specialize in specific services, X and Y. We have subcontract work currently with DEA. And we're interested in talking about the specific upcoming DEA task order requirement, Big Z, for example. I know exactly what to do with a requirement with a request like this. I, I show it to our Department of Justice BD lead and ask if they're interested. Usually they're interested, too, as a function of how much information they've got. Even if they're not going to team with you on that particular opportunity, they're usually interested in talking to you. And that's where you get things started. You have contact now and you have the opportunity to build a relationship with a decision maker on team teaming. So that's that's what a good reach outreach to a larger business for subcontracting looks like. You, you, you self differentiate in terms of what you offer, service or technologies, ideally a niche service or technology and, a, and, a, and an up to date one as um, as Kitty was just talking about. But also, if you have developed, as Gloria talked about, an, a, a relationship with an age, a specific agency, you can put those two things together and get a specific target. You're really much, much more likely to get genuine engagement that's going to pay off, if not in the short run, in the long run. So I'll just wrap it up by saying self-differentiation. It's marketing 101, but it applies to subcontracting efforts as well. And I know the newer your firm, the harder it is and the more frustrating it can be, but it remains a requirement for success. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mike. Fantastic information. Uh, we have just about a minute left. So I think, uh, let me check. Yes. Uh, and I can see all the virtual applause coming in for everybody. Um, you know, one of the common threads that I heard throughout there was that, you know, don't don't do everything. Don't try to be everything. Really try to uh, be selective and have a plan. Do your research. Um, and all three of you said that in in so many words, which I think is just so true. And I hope the audience really picked up on that as well. Uh, so I want to say thank you again to our panel of industry experts. Uh, you guys bring so much experience. Uh, and success to this platform. Thank you for sharing it with us and thank you for being here. Uh, okay, that being said, uh, we are about to take a short break uh, and then we're gonna transition into our training tracks, our three different training tracks. Uh, so we will end this room and everyone take a small break, rehydrate, grab a, grab a bite to eat uh, and we will meet you back in whichever training session you've selected to join. Thanks everyone.